And as is usually the case on these stories, so this time we're reading The Immortal and The Theologians. Um, I don't know where to start, but uh, I will just read a passage that I found a little perplexing. Um, and then you guys can respond, uh, you know, go somewhere else. Um, but this is on page 111 in the Dover edition. It's right before, immediately before the end of chapter three, if you, I guess those are called chapters in the immortal. And it's when, um, when he's gotten into the city and he's wandering around and it's just a, you know, bizarre, sort of like Escher-esque place and at the at the right before the chapter three he says i am no longer able to know if such and such a detail is a transcription of reality or of the forms which unhinged my nights this city i thought is so horrible that its mere existence and perdurance though in the midst of a secret desert contaminates the past and the future and in some way jeopardizes the stars as long as it lasts, no one in the world can be strong or happy. I do not want to describe it, a chaos of heterogeneous words, a tiger or a bull in which teeth, organs, and head monstrously pullulate in mutual conjunction and hatred can perhaps be approximate images. And so I'm just wondering, what, I mean, I, I understand that the city is um, crazy, you know, doors that don't go anywhere and stairs that are upside down and and just insanity but what why why is it why does it in his mind have this almost cosmic and metaphysical implication uh so i i mean that's just a real question i don't know but so you guys can respond to that or or just jump to something else if you prefer I um I guess I I felt like um and this is like a, probably like a naive sort of um reading but again but uh, I felt like the, the 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 narrator um seemed to kind of grapple with two two extremes that then had two extremes on each which was hating and loving of mortality and immortality and it was this like constantly kind of undulating between well, immortality is what this man sought, and I sought it, and I, I didn't. And he said that one line that I was confused at, where he said, "I didn't have to believe in it; I just thought seeking it was enough." But um, he talked about how he talked to some philosophers who said that immortality would be only increasing his deaths and his, his you know, all, all his suffering and his agony. Um, and then he 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 finds the immortality, and he starts. I, I figured it was it was you know, or I guess this this source of what he feels to be this immortality, this chaos, and he kind of I guess identified with those earlier remarks that it was horrible, that it was this this sort of um, extension of agony, you know, in the direction of it. It's like chaos made infinite in a way. That 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 is this sort of absolute extension of agony that I think he was relating to. Uh, at least in the in the present in appearance, you know, which then I guess he he tries to kind of um, reconcile with himself as he's learning that these troglodytes did not, uh, if I, you know, because that's the term he used. They did not. They're not just these, you know, troglodytes. They're like it's like it's Homer and it's it's Argos and all of this, you know. I I felt like um, I felt like it was just this sort of batting back and forth between these two positions of hating and loving, but, but I, I don't know. Chase, we, we, okay. yeah. So, but uh, my internet is really bad today, especially. So I may cut out, but the way I saw it is that this, uh, this city is kind of like, it's sort of almost like a condensed form of infinity or, eternity it's something incomprehensible that the idea of like if we could actually grasp the infinite or the eternal in some way or all the contingencies of time that time brings all these things beyond you know our finitude in life that is kind of like this discernible territory that we surround ourselves are a milieu you know this is kind of like going 
radically outside of that. And he's seeing basically all these things that go beyond this like merely human comprehension to see all of these forms that go well beyond like human categories. And that's why it has this kind of a, uh, you know, like non-Euclidean kind of thing. This is like, seriously, there's HP Lovecraft stories that are just like this where they go and see these cities of the elder gods, you know, that existed before mankind. And he describes them as like non-Euclidean geometries that like drive the mind insane and whatnot. And I think it's something like that, that it's basically, if you could see all these possibilities beyond what is limited to say a single normal finite life or, or culture or whatnot, then it would be something that's really incomprehensible. And that incomprehensibleness is something that therefore kind of questions the, the order of the world in the sense of if it can bring this into existence, this is ult- this indifferent infinitude is ultimately what all this is and we're just on a this very small island of of sense and these vast waters of cosmic ignorance then what does that say about basically existence as a whole so i think that's where he's saying basically like it contaminates the past and the future and in some way even jeopardizes the stars so the stars being like a the idea of a fixed order oh, and also the, the constellation seeing patterns and things like that. And this is something that basically completely inverts that the idea of like a pattern in a fixed order or something like that. That's the way I sell that. Um, if I, yeah, if I could just uh, jump on what the both of you said, um, <clears throat> if a person I mean, think of Homer, if he really did exist. Think of this soldier, proconsul, whatever the Roman person was whose, whose story we're kind of seeing. How would you, I, I was thinking if, if I had somehow, I was trying to put myself into this Roman and then seeing the fall of Rome, the barbarian invasions, even if I travel to beyond the Roman Empire um, and one damn thing following after another how would how would i interpret it what would be because we it seems to me we always as human beings want to interpret what we're experiencing or see other people experiencing we want you said it chase about pattern we we seek patterns we want to see patterned activity there's um continuity under the same conditions certain outcomes will happen and then because we're humans also, we like to think most of us like, well, we follow a certain code or certain ethical or moral principles and beliefs. You make it through the middle ages and now you're in the Renaissance. Now you, you finally, we see industrialization. I mean, how would any sane human being react to the massive changes in human history from whenever the Iliad was, was, was written to the 19 was it 1920s 30s what how, how could any human being make sense of that and think of human memory i mean remember when he has homer saying finally starts talking starts finally making sense and says oh yes um yes i invented that uh, a couple thousand years ago or whatever maybe at that time it was just a thousand and we're not, as you said, it's not normal human lifespan. What, what, are, what is the human capacity to understand and to make sense of? Is it, is it really connected temporally to the normal human lifespan? And what if that is extended a thousand years? It is, I mean, if he's, if he's starting to have problems speaking, if he's having problems remembering a lot of different things, isn't that, wouldn't that be normal? I mean, I think he's, I, I know this is, this is oddly written, but I think he's seriously dealing with the issue of immortality and the infinite 
and the, 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 the difficulties that human beings who are finite, who are not eternal, would have if they actually lived 2,500 years. Hmm. You know, that makes me think there's kind of like a, an interesting paradox going on here because in one sense, it's kind of like what we were just talking about where it's almost like he's seen so much change that it's incomprehensible in a way. But then also, you know, like the whole idea of a, it's almost like this accelerated cultural relativity that is kind of blown everything out of uh, comprehensibility. So there's kind of that element, but then there's also this element of like discovering finitude in there where uh, someone later in the story, where is it? Probably, I think, uh, I think it's one sixth. No, uh, I'm not sure. So later in the story, he basically, he's talking about the idea of like cyclical time and about how these people, you know, the immortals, the troglodytes or whatever, they've basically done everything that could possibly be done. It's so I think it, there's something of a kind of a false notion in there that basically it's like there's finite elements of events that you can do. And because of that, if you live long enough, you're going to repeat all those infinitely. Uh, I think it's the same kind of uh, Nietzsche when he is somewhat like playing around in his notebooks, trying to figure out like a, a sort of um, physical aspect of the eternal return, like talked about that idea. So basically from that, you get this kind of, it's almost like a, they've lapsed into silence, these immortals, because there's no point. Basically he says like, everything becomes basically indifferent. If, you know, everything that can be done, must be done by everyone that is immortal, given enough time, all these things will happen innumerably to the point where there's no distinction. I think it's basically like finitude and the limitation that would give any event meaning, the, the idea that it could have not happened. That's what gives choice any kind of meaning. So here there's, there would be no choice. There would there would be no meaning to any to doing one event or the other because all events will happen anyways innumerable times. So it's almost like this kind of uh, like despair of the finite, I guess, versus the kind of despair of the infinite. And it's like they have both of them simultaneously in a sense. So I'm not sure exactly how to kind of put those together, but... Seems interesting. Well, two things when you were talking. Uh, I read one review of this story, and I'm going to defer to all of you because uh, uh, the, the, the reviewer mentioned Nietzsche's theory of eternal return. And, and in that concept, at least what this reviewer said, is that infinite time wipes out the identity of individuals, which seemed to be so spot on with what what was what the troglodytes, what the human beings were experiencing. And then also as the story went on, when he reached the city, it reminded me of H.G. Wells and the time machine, the future society where people are so indifferent that someone's drowning, no one tries to save the person. I mean, it, it's, it's not that they're cruel, they're just like, well, it's, I'm not drowning. And, and you have this society where, People are kind of pastoral. They don't seem to care about much of anything, even each other's. Uh, there's no deep relationships. And so I just, I never would have put Nietzsche and H.G. Wells together, but I, th there seems to be something in both of them uh, in this story. And I know Borges did read H.G. Wells uh, because Wells would have wrote the bulk of his novels. My memory was 1895 to 1900. And with Borges being born in 1899, that Wells would have still been a current literary figure. So, but anyway, I don't know what you think about H.G. Wells or the Nietzsche connection. 
One, di one possible difference with uh, Nietzsche's notion of eternal return is that uh, presumably if, if, uh, we, if I was to live my life an infinite number of times, I would not know that. And so because I don't have any memory of those previous lives, and so every time I live my life, it, it feels as though it's the first time. You know, it's still, eternal return still has a sort of an existential, it's an existential test. You know, it's more of a, a way of saying, can I affirm my existence the way it has been in this extreme fashion that I would will that it happens an infinite number of times. But unlike the case in, the, in this story, you know, these guys remember that they've lived for so long and that they've, you know, repeated their lives over and over. And so I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure what to make of that, but I, uh, um, but it seems like that's important. The fact that they, within a sing, well, within a single lifetime, I don't know, within a single existence to, to live your life over and over and over, but knowing that you're living your life over and over and over seems to be, worse than than forgetting it each time um and then the other thing that occurred to me you know based on what what chase was saying and I, you know this is a a fr friend of mine once many, many years ago i can tell you a few strings but not a lot but here here's one of them that i've talked about over and over is this um this idea of oh god i just left my mind <laughs> Uh, give me just a second. So, oh, so the, the, the intelligibility, you know, when, when, when Chase was talking about the intelligibility of, of things, that um, especially in the West, Western philosophy, we've been obsessed with the intelligibility of the universe. And so the Greeks had, the, the classical Greeks had this deep conviction that the universe was intelligible, it was rational, it made sense. And so the discovery of irrational numbers was a, a kind of tragedy. And then, you know, during the Christian era, um, everyone just knew that the, the world of nature was, was a divine book, just as much as the scriptures are. So they, you know, some Christian theologians would talk about the book of scripture and the book of nature. And so you could read, you could read the, the, the mind and will of God out of nature, just like you could out of the Bible, because nature was a manifestation of the divine intelligence. And then I don't know, you know, anyway, th then Hegel says the real is the rational, you know, so, you know, responding to, you know, like Kant that says, nope, there's a whole domain of existence that is just doesn't make any damn sense. And Hegel's like, no, the real is the rational. But this, you know, maybe, so maybe, you know, kind of bouncing off of Chase's comments, maybe if we could live long enough, we would have to, we would, we would be forced to face the unintelligibility of existence. And, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of, you know, uh, Camus and the, abs the absurdity of existence and so on. And maybe what allows us to live, to, to continue to reassert this myth of the intelligibility of existence is because we have, a, we have finite lives. And so we can try to convince ourselves of that. But if we were to live long enough, you know, it's like these, because that city apparently at one time was a regular city, but then these troglodytes, after they've lived for centuries, they just sort of go nuts and start making all these crazy architectural structures as, you know, maybe a reflection of their, their, their experience of the world after hundreds and hundreds of years. And so anyway, a couple of thoughts. Also, I think it's kind of interesting that the immortals, troglodytes, they, they basically leave the city eventually. It's like they had that realization and then they left the city and kind of regressed to this infantile state in a sense that I think that's kind of like where it's like at first they basically had 
you know, that experience of the incomprehensibility of going through that where, you know, they, they lost their identity. They lost any sense of a kind of rational order to things. And that makes them basically go crazy and build their non-Euclidean uh, MC Escher city. And then there's kind of like this exhaustion from that where they kind of retreat into this sort of, you know, uh, back into the womb. He talks about them a lot as like as infantile, like this regressive state of just wanting to, it's almost like being like the, the walking dead in a sense, like they can't die, but the closest thing they can get to it is this kind of like oblivion of mind of, of just kind of walking around and not saying anything. And, but then again, I think they, he talks about how they think still, and they're kind of like enraptured by the beauty of thought or something like that. So maybe my interpretation is, is bullshit then. Yeah, I was at the bottom, the very bottom of uh, 113, which is the first paragraph in chapter four, um, is where he, he mentions that, and then at the bottom of that paragraph, absorbed in thought, they hardly perceive the physical world. So, you know, is, are, they, are they in this kind of weird pseudo catatonic state because they're so disconnected from the physical world that they're living in these purely mental worlds? Or, I mean, it seems hard to, re sorry for that noise, and I'm gonna make it shut up. Um, or, you know, because another I thought possibility is that, you know, that I wonder, are there only so many thoughts you can think? You know, like Chase was saying, you know, there's only, only so many lives you can live. Maybe there's only, maybe I'm wrong about that. But I, how, you know, how many thoughts can there be before you just start repeating your thoughts? And then at some point, thought itself becomes kind of pointless. And so, what, I mean, what else is, I mean, what do you do? I mean, you can't die. And you've thought about everything you could think about. So what are you going to do? You know, you're just, ah. so uh, that's why I, I mean, I'm wondering the same thing that Chase is wondering, you know, absorbed in thought, they were, you know, they, they kind of dropped out of the physical world. But on the other hand, it seems like thought would have its limits too. Well, it seems like on 115, it says that uh, like, a third of the way down, it says the body for them was a submissive domestic animal, and it sufficed to give it every month the pittance of a few hours of sleep, a bit of water, and a scrap of meat. Uh, which makes me think that, so while they could think, they, they were kind of distanced from their bodies. Like, they didn't really have, like, a, a connection to the physical world, and so perception, and, and so many things that I think allow us to think in these meaningful ways, and allow us to kind of connect thought to the world have been kind of uh, destroyed for them in a sense, you know, they, they have no relation to their body, which is definitely a part of kind of thought and, and this process of being a human. So I think that that's, that's definitely a part is that being immortal, like with, without your body kind of dying and decaying, you can't really relate to it or you're not forced to be reminded of it. What chapter was that in? Uh, that was in four, Thanks. chapter four. <laughs> okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. So I think you go with uh, Merleau Ponty on that point too, in the sense of he's, you know, he talks about how important this kind of embodied uh, not consciousness, but basically embodiment itself is for making sense of the world, for connecting us with the, the world as a whole. And I see that definitely here and the way that they talk about that. So they're, they're so absorbed in thought, but it's, it's basically this kind of ethereal, almost inactive thought that it's like, you know, almost like a hamster wheel of a thought that doesn't actually engage the world outside of themselves. Like he talks about, you know, what he, his, uh, 
his buddy uh, Argos, who, who's really Homer, I guess, or something like that. He talks about it as like living in his own world in the sense of like they both lived somewhat in the same world, but he had his own kind of like private universe in a sense. And he couldn't translate anything between the universes. I think that that's something to do with also with the nature of how they they've somewhat like neglected the body because the body is, I think the, the concern for the body would come about from a kind of, uh, I wouldn't say like an anxiety, but like a concern about your finitude in a sense that, you know, you would care about something like that as, as an effect of you knowing that, you know, your life depends on it to a certain degree. And I don't think it's necessarily just a negative thing like that. Um, but still, I, I think by losing that concern about themselves, they basically have lost all this connection, therefore, with the outer world in a lot of ways. And instead, it's all this kind of um, unengaging thought that can't, you know, really do something with the world because it's, it's so disconnected at that point is it's just this kind of, uh, you know, the hamster wheel of thought that can't really engage with these things because it doesn't see the point to it anymore because it's basically thought all these finite elements of thought already and seen basically also, you know, a kind of uh, cosmic indifference to it all. So who knows? This, th this is pretty... Uh, Oh, this story is pretty, pretty bleak, really. But uh, yeah, well, don't be immortal. I think is the lesson. Um, well, um please go ahead. I, I was just gonna follow on uh, Travis. You, you, I, I found the the um, the quotation um, in chapter four, and you said the body for them was a submissive domestic animal. Um, but but if you go to the next two sentences let no one reduce us to the status of ascetics ascetics there is no more there is no pleasure more complex than that of thought and we surrendered ourselves to it it seems to me that that is that, that there is no pleasure more complex than that of thought to me is a very important sentence uh for this short story because it seems what he's saying is that he's making a very broad comment about human beings in general. Which would give a key to why people were acting the way they were. I, yeah, I, I was, this is Joey, by the way. Why, why can't we not see the long here? <laughs> he showed us a few like goofy faces. <laughs> and then I was on accident. I was just doing some stuff earlier. And yeah, I have to go to work. Uh, I, we, again, so I'm kind of just remaining on my phone. Um, but I the the sentence of there not being any pleasure more complex than thought, it still seems to me that that's almost like sign even more so that they're able to kind of disconnect from their bodies. Um, if they're just kind of like wrapped up in this pleasure, they're not having like I guess like as Travis said, they're not having to be reminded of like the sufferings of the world and engage in the world around them. Um, and then, um, like for me, I, so like, I think it was, we were touching on it earlier, like the paragraph at the top of 115, the paragraph that ends at the top of 115, where he says, you know, um, one man is all men when you're immortal, you know, it erases the eye, it erases like that kind of like singular identity. Um, I s still am confused and I feel like it has to do something with that, but about the last two pages, where he's talking about the kind of like sense of falsity he gets from his own narrative um, and just seeing that like there's a part of him that's like reporting these like as Homer or in some Homeric way and then there's like you know some other person like uh, he mentions like one way is like from a warrior proper to a warrior the other one does not linger over warlike deeds um, I am kind of very much confused over those last two pages and why, what's the deal with the, the mixing of the, the selections? Um, why is that significant? 
Yeah, I had somewhat uh, trouble following that last part also in that he he says, you know, going back and looking over my story, um, it seems, you know, I, let's see, I can't quite remember exactly, but he says something like, it seems to have, I've confused myself with other people or something like that. Um, so is that the thing that he's basically, you know, lived enough of these uh, narratives of lives and whatnot that he's essentially kind of collapsed into like this, you know, non-identity, this like non-discernibility of a kind of definite or finite You're freezing again. Oh, there I'm you back. Are. Go ahead. What were you saying? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, my internet's really bad today. Um, so, basically, I think it would kind of go along with the theme that you need some kind of finitude. You need some kind of, of you know, discernible identity, almost in a way, kind of like what Funes talks about, in order to actually make sense of this stuff. And by not having that, I think that's why he's got these identities confused with each other. And that's kind of what he's talking about. I seem to have, uh, you know, added a. If are you back again? I am now. Yeah. Oh, okay. It, you 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 froze again, so uh, we didn't hear what you were. Okay. Uh, attempt th number three. Okay. So basically, he's saying that there's problems when you don't have any finitude or kind of discrete, discernible identities, and it, it basically all kind of meshes into one thing. And that's kind of what I think he's looking back and he's saying, I think I've confused myself with other people because he doesn't, he's lost that ability to kind of make, you know, finite distinctions between things. So I think that's possibly kind of what he's going for, but I may be wrong because I don't know. I just don't really remember much of that very end part again, but yeah. I think it, he's being very consistent in his own narrative with his observations of the effects of prolong extraordinarily prolonged life on the brain, on the mind, on the human mind and ability to relate oneself to the world. So it wasn't just Homer that it took Homer a while to say, you know, I think I invented that a thousand years ago. Um, and so it's happening again to, to this Roman. And, uh, and, and in some ways, in, in, in the last part, right before the, the two paragraphs before the postscript, more towards the bottom, he says, <coughs> he, he makes comments about his own writing that reminded me of Pierre Menard, the author of The Coyote. He said, spoken by the, he says, those which follow are even more curious. Their dark elemental reason obliged me to record them. I did it because I knew they were pathetic. Spoken by the Roman Flaminius Rufus, they are not. They are spoken by Homer. It is strange that the latter should copy in the 13th century the adventures of Sinbad and other Ulysses and should discover after many centuries in a northern kingdom and a barbarous tongue the forms of his Iliad. And so he's like, he's, he's, and also, and this may be stretching it, but remember Borges is a storyteller. And, and what, what does a storyteller do in trying to present 
a truth or truths as he or she understands it. Do they, do they want the literal truth or are they, you know, there's a, I think there's a line from uh, Emily Dickinson in one of her poems where she says, tell the truth, but tell it slant. And, you know, is Borges, <coughs> in, in this character of Borges, is he, is he showing that even in the storytelling that there might be aesthetic reasons or storytelling reasons for the way the material was presented, which would call into question the historical veracity of this man's autobiography, so to speak? Are there compelling storytelling needs that are different from the needs of uh, history? I think um, one of you young guys should write a dissertation on the notion of personal identity in the works of Borges because it keeps popping up, you know, in so many stories and he keeps coming at it at different angles. So they're a free dissertation topic. Um, I, I had to step out because of a medical insurance call thing, but so I'm going to go back to, uh, I hope you don't mind if I go back to something you were talking about earlier. Um, when, when Chase was talking, when you guys were talking about embodiment, you know, based on that, um, my, my son and I were having a conversation a while back about Merleau-Ponty and, and the, you know, consciousness and embodiment. And um, we begin to, to wonder, talk, you know, think about artificial intelligence. And um, we don't really have any, anything like that today. I mean, people have things they call artificial intelligence, but it's, it's a pretty attenuated notion of intelligence. But it, let's assume that you could have some kind of real uh, self-reflective consciousness in a non-biological body uh, or any kind of, you know, like, like a, a virtual consciousness on the internet or something, or something like data from Star Trek. Um, there was a story, I think maybe it was in one of the Black Mirror episodes or something where um, they had a, an artificial mechanical body and I think they put this guy's brain in it or maybe they just transferred his consciousness into a cybernetic body. I can't remember which. But the person that they did that to just went insane because the, the mechanical body is nothing like a physical human body. And, you know, my consciousness is an embodied consciousness in a physical body of a certain kind. And I'm not sure, I mean, I, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure that if you had even a fully self-conscious rational intellect in a mechanical body, that, that consciousness would subjectively be like my consciousness because my consciousness is an embodied consciousness. I mean, it would, I'm not saying it wouldn't be a legitimate kind of consciousness, I'm just saying qualitatively, it might be very, very different. And so, you know, relating it to this story, I'm thinking, you know, what, what Travis and Chase and you guys were talking about, that if you, if you had a, a situation where someone had lived so long that they had essentially withdrawn their consciousness from their body, that that, what, that consciousness would be fundamentally different in, in, in important ways from, from an embodied consciousness. And so maybe that's part of the reason for the sort of catatonia. And then when, you know, you have these events that sort of recall them back to their body. So for example, when it rains, the, it's something new and it's like it, it, it hooks them back into their body and they're, and they're back again. Or a stranger comes into town and it's like, that's different. And that, that sort of calls forth a, a, a an embodied response, but um, it, but they're, they're the bulk of their lives if they're sort of lost in this disembodied mode of consciousness. Um, I'm not sure that would be recognizably human, that you know, recognizably human sort of consciousness. I think yeah. I think a good support for that point too is um, the the portion where I guess um, one of the immortals had fallen into a hole. 
and it took them like 70 years to actually get him out. <clears throat> and so as far as being able to identify or empathize with that humanity of someone being injured, like the guy that got injured didn't even care. It was kind of one of those, like he, I guess, oh, it's been 70 years. This guy's here. Pull him out, you know, for one reason or another. And so I think that's a, a, a good way to support that viewpoint. And the guy, the injured guy himself didn't seem to care that much. Right. It was, it was just kind of a, a completely just non-experience to him. <laughs> um, I think uh, the reason you really, you got grease in the wheels here. I, I think um, you, what you said has got, uh, I think I, 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 I've got at least one more related idea that I think I'm seeing a lot of in this story kind of consistently. And it's that, yes, as the, as the consciousness experiences, let's say, you know, however many years, it starts to behave in this way where identity falls away, narrative falls away, the sense of like thinking of your life as a story, which apparently we do, that starts to fall away. And, and they retreat into this pleasure of, uh, of reflection and kind of solipsism in a way almost. Um, but I, I think that, um, I think that it, it reminds me a lot of, and this is my uh, like very banal understanding of this material that I'm pulling from, but it reminds me a lot of uh, death drives, like Freudian death drives, where, where all, all of our experience as a subject, not as like a human consciousness, but just as a, as a subject, we are driven forward. And each of these drives implies this self-negation where it's like, it's kind of like that old thing, like I, I, I want water or, or I you know, I want water. And you're with that phrase, you're marking out I as this thing that's never quite the next thing. You know, there's this, this con through, it's kind of, okay, okay, Bergson, perfect example. Bergson, recently, in the last reading, he said, um, uh, the suppleness of life is frozen, frigid in the formula that expresses it. You remember that? I, I think that these people are experiencing the extreme of experience being codified and put into formula through their through their thoughts, you know, the rationalization of things to the point that, that, that things become frozen, you know, and, and this, this drive of self-negation, this drive of progress in their opinion, away from the, the, the suppleness of life, away from the embodiment of their bodies, you know, the, the, the perceptive faculties that Marlou Ponty talks about. Um, I just think that, I think that, I guess I read, I read um, one thing differently. And it's that uh, when they experience bodily stimuli, what do you say, some sort of extraordinary stimuli? Oh yeah, at, okay, on right where we were talking about with a few hours of sleep, a bit of water and a scrap of meat, no pleasure more complex than that of thought, we surrender ourselves to it. Right then very next sentence, he says, at times an extraordinary stimulus would restore us to the physical ward. For example, that morning, the old elemental joy of rain, those lapses were quite rare. Uh, they were capable of perfect quietude, and they talked about a man with a bird nesting on him. Uh, as a fun example, I think that I, I think that what you said earlier about all the real is rational, right? I think that that's it's not that like like Hegel because he wrote like a ponce. Uh, he's he's not being direct when he's saying that. I think, and that's only because of the lectures that I've listened to. So I'm not, but. I think that it's, when he's saying all of the real is rational, I don't think he's saying like, just we can take everything and codify it and that's good, we should do that. That's, that's self-consciousness, we need to, like, like if that were the case, Hegel would be like, oh, I wanna be one of the immortals, that sounds great, you know, that sounds odd. But I think that the, um, the rational being real comes out much more um, directly or, or I guess uh, um, fully uh, holistically, I suppose, in the notion that the phrase, I am here with you right now, that whole phrase is, the, it is as particular and as unique and, and individualized as possible. It is as particular as physically, I am here with you right now. <laughs> and at the same time, it is a completely empty universal set of signifiers that have no inherent quality or meaning. It, it's just this which is where he got gets into the conversation with the word I and all this shit. But yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, I think that these events, like the rain falling on them, it doesn't just, it doesn't just kind of make them go, oh, I have, I have flesh again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a human. But I think that it, it 
activates this rationale. It, it, because if they conceive of the world as just this plan of, of stuff, you know, and, and in fact, as they experience it over thousands and thousands of years, it becomes codified, it becomes rationalized. But there is this, this constant source of renewal, I think, in subjectivity, in the I, in the here, and in the now, you know what I mean? And I think that that falls away because of this, this death drive, this desire to codify, this will to rationalize, this, this desire to, to say, oh, that's all in vain, whatever, let's all just go sleep in a hole outside. Uh, there's this, this will to do that in these immortals. And in fact, even the, the, the main character, this Roman guy, he starts getting into it. He starts feeling it a little, a little bit, you know? I, 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 think that, I think that there's a drive for this sort of death and this catatonic state which I feel is, is kind of, um, it's like a swamp that hasn't moved for many centuries and then some rock gets thrown into it and disturbs the ecosystem. If that's what I think the rain is, you know what I mean? And I think that it not only reignites their passion and suppleness for life, but I think that it's a necessary element in kind of the, the fight against a death drive, you know, the, the will to, to continue rationalizing things in a meaningful way in a way that um he says late and which is why i think that i think that he's like it's very like this is a very straightforward story that death is kind of like a good thing in certain instances where he says on the next pair actually two paragraphs after the quote i just said on page 115 and chapter four at the beginning of this the paragraph at the bottom of the page he says death or its illusion makes men precious and pathetic and it talks about their phantom condition and everything dissolving and falling away. I think that he's, I think that Borges is making just this sort of illustrative point about the, the value found in opposing these drives that, that there's, there's a necessary sort of paradox in human experience. We want to be immortal and we want to just go live in a hole <laughs> forever, but we're not allowed to. And that's good. We shouldn't do that. I think I, basically, if I can just put it in as simple terms, that's my point. That's my argument, I guess. Okay. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there that hopefully I've got everything in mind on how to respond to that, but Okay, my internet's being terrible, so I'm probably going to be cut out. Um, so this reminds me a lot of also Bergson and his notion, just his notion in general of the intellect and how the intellect tries to grasp life. So the intellect, it, it sees things basically as like closed sets of discrete elements. And it seems like that kind of despair of the finite that's going on here is kind of like the intellect that can only see uh, repetition of the same. It can only see uh, recombinations of the same elements, you know, over and over. So from that perspective, it would be the same things occurring. And there would be a kind of, you know, uh, kind of despair in, in those things in that, you know, nothing new can really happen in that sense. And that also kind of reminds me of, and he says, okay, so Bergson says, basically, this can only, this is at home, this intellect that, you know, puts this discontinuity in, into the continuous whole, that it's at home and thinking of inanimate matter. So Freud says that the death drive is basically a drive, essentially, back to inanimate matter, that it's kind of this repetition of the same that's trying to go back to the form of inanimate matter, to this lifeless thing. And I can definitely see that there in the sense that this is a kind of, uh, like many of Borges' stories, I think it's kind of about the, the kind of natural faults of the intellect in a way. But then he also usually puts these into a paradox where he says, but in the same sense, they're also kind of necessary because he also says that in a lot of ways, you know, you need this kind of discreteness. You need the intellect to kind of, you know, cut these things apart and put them into grids in order to have any kind of meaning at all. So it seems like it's kind of wavering between these two aspects of the, the necessity of the intellect and to discern things into, you know, kind of concrete 
finite elements, at discernible people, things like that, that there's a ne necessity to finitude and how we think and how we live and how we get meaning in life. But then on the same time that if this is kind of extrapolated too far, then you get this kind of despair and this, uh, this kind of resignation where you're no longer living. You're basically like the, the transhuman that, you know, is completely embodied. There's this pure binary information that becomes this kind of Frankensteinian kind of, uh, you know, simulacra of life itself that because it can't really actually grasp the full continuity of these things and the novel. It can only think in terms of these finite, discrete, binary elements. So I definitely see that there, there's something going on there with, with the intellect, with this notion of like the death drive and inanimate matter and the discrete and all these things. So I can't believe, oh, my, did my internet cut out? I can't believe it didn't, wow. I don't know anything. I, I don't know very little about Freud and, and almost nothing about the death drive. So I, I may say, say something stupid, but, um, but I, what this makes me think of is, you know, if these guys are in a situation where they cannot die and if they're, you know, physically they can't die, of the human consciousness that, that kind of needs to die uh, or wants to die because it's part of the natural process perhaps. And, but they can't die physically. And so, you know, maybe, and I, I, this is sort of uh, not very well worked out in my mind, but maybe this retreat, and maybe this is the same, maybe this is all, what you guys are saying. I'm, I'm just not getting it, but that this retreat into consciousness is, a, is in a sense, a kind of death, a kind of suspension, um, and, and then I'm, you know, I'm, Plato pops into my mind. I don't know if Freud ever said anything about Plato, but um, if you think about the forms, you know, the forms for Plato are ultimate reality. They're the ultimately real, but they also are in a sense dead because they don't ever change. They're eternal and changeless. Whereas this world of, of phenomena is where all the change in life is. And so, you know, maybe there's, there's something about retreat into intellectuality, retreat into the mind is a kind of, of death of some kind. So it's like, you know, so I'm wondering, it's like these guys, they can't physically die. So maybe this is the best they can do is to, you know, is to retreat into their minds. Well, yeah, that reminds me of the fact that there's, like, I, I love the fact that there's this river of immortality and once the, all these people become immortal, they're like, oh, well, there must be a river of mortality and we got to go find that, you know? It's just like, you know, if you're immortal, you just want to be mortal and if you're mortal, you just want to be immortal. And and to me, that there's like a real possibility, I think, that that, that this character, you know, on his journey, just maybe he dies, you know, and this is the afterlife. Like, this is what it's like to die and that you you basically come back into the world as this immortal thing and then basically until you want to be mortal again and then actually really die you know it's just like because i think everyone kind of has this desire to to not die you know and so to to be completely in death would to be would be to you know accept death for what it is and then and then die you know i guess i don't know <laughs> yeah i also was kind of wondering about that interpretation that how he kind of you know miraculously shows up there and it, that maybe he did die and since this, this is kind of like an afterlife this kind of interminable hellish afterlife where he has to go through everything in a sense until he then sort of wills back his own mortality in his, or he comes to kind of full circle back to mortality. And, you know, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's maybe, you know, Boris is like, 
uh, like soul intention here, but I think it's definitely an interesting interpretation. But uh, getting, yeah, okay. I was checking if I had cut out, but um, so to go back to what Nevin was saying about uh, kind of like this retreat from the world into the intellect as a kind of death, I think you can kind of make a distinction between um, so the intellect in a kind of like purely quantitative way would see life only as just kind of like a mere survival. And it's basically just about, you know, extending that survival indefinitely. And it's about the quantity of life and any kind of aspect of the quality or the qualitative aspect of life is, you know, unthinkable to the quantitative intellect. And so you can see a difference between like mere survival and then actually living where it seems like they're the immortals are surviving quantitatively. They're continuously surviving, but then they've actually lost the, the sense of living. So you can also relate this to Nietzsche's idea of, you know, the last man who's, you know, ineradicable as the flea who continues pretty much indefinitely. And then there's the, and also who he says has, you know, the smallest world. And then there's, you know, someone who's actually going to, to live fully to, uh, you know, the eternal return in this sense would be, you know, the Ubermensch who would like affirm the eternal return, affirms that, that finitude and kind of just lives in order to to grasp the fullness of that, of actually living this finite life instead of just, you know, extending it indefinitely in a quantitative manner. So I think there's probably something like that that you could say where he is trying to say, you know, a lot of ways that this immortality is a kind of death. And I think you get that, a good sense of that from making this distinction between a kind of like mere survival and then, you know, actually living and that to actually live require, does require some kind of finitude and, and a limitation to it in order to make sense of it. That's a link to the lyrics of a song by my favorite band. Um, but anyway, so you can play that if you want. But I, it's just, it's an interesting uh, parallel. Um, the song is about someone who finds the famed Xanadu um, where you can drink the milk of paradise and leave for, live forever. And in the middle of the song, you know, he says a thousand years have come and gone, but time has passed me by. and. Uh, I'm waiting for the world to end weary of the night. So, you know, living forever could be a drag. Uh, to extend kind of what I was saying, and because uh, I'm trying to understand, like, there's, to me, there's mortality. And then there's immortality. And then there's like a second mortality where he is like, kind of changed from immortality. You know, he has this perspective now. And he, he says that he's kind of mixed the events of two different men which makes me think more and more about this, this kind of possibility of this being his death, like some kind of idea of reincarnation, basically, where he will, when he dies as, an immor as a mortal, the second time he will become a mortal again and interact with another person who ends up, and then, and then he has the mixed events of three men <laughs> and his third mortality, and then eventually he interacts with every single person who's ever existed and becomes actually dead. So, I don't know. Does that make sense? <laughs> Should we? I admit you kind of lost me there at the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine then. Let's move on. <laughs> so, should we um, migrate to the theologians? Um, I, I was a fundamentalist Christian for a long time and studied theology some somewhat um and at some point it just came seems kind of pointless <laughs> which is kind of like reading the story is like why do these people care about this shit 
but uh, I don't know. I guess, I mean, the, the interesting thing is, you know, we've been talking about uh, identity in the first story, but, but again, I don't, you know, the editor, who, the guys who edit this book, I think put a lot of thought into the editing, both in the sequence of the stories and in, in the general topic, because, you know, the, the top of the book, the title of the book is La Labyrinths, and, and, you know, a labyrinth appears in the word labyrinth, at least in almost every story, and then another, um, and maybe as Ed is, has pointed out, maybe this is partially just because identity was was one of Borges' uh, uh, obsessions, but um, that seems to be a crucial uh, issue here too, because at the end, again, it's kind of like what what it's like that other story, you know, where the guy uh, tell you know where he is describing a murder and then turns out to be the murderer um, at the end of this story. <laughs> he's in heaven, he's like, oh yeah, you and that guy, you're the same guy. So anyway, I thought, I thought the, this sort of theme of identity coursing through here was interesting. Okay, we'll see you guys next time. No, <laughs> <laughs> I think given the uh, given the context of the story and especially the very end of it, I thought it was incredibly interesting because it just the the futility of like his life's work of trying to be the antithesis of this other man. But at the end of the day, it's like, well, I they we are one and the same. We are two, we are one. So I thought it was an incredibly interesting, um, very poignant point that he made. You know, I've I've thought. At times, you know, be, I don't know, because of the stuff I'm interested in, you know, what gives life meaning and all this kind of stuff. And actually recently, uh, yesterday, Craig sent me a email and said, hey, would you be interested in teaching that meaning of life class? Because you seem to be kind of obs obsessed with this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I can do that. Um, and I, you know, I wonder about things like um, the medieval monks who spent their entire lives doing nothing but but transcribing texts, you know, prior to the printing pr press. And, you know, you have these elaborate illuminated biblical texts where these guys uh, are drawing these pictures and stuff, but their entire lives are nothing but every day getting up and transcribing biblical texts. And, and then, you know, there's people who, whose entire lives are consumed with just trying to stay alive, right? You know, they're just, they get up and their entire lives are just find some food for me and my kids and try not to die. Um, and, and then, you know, you have uh, first world problems like this guy's, you know, where I am a theologian and I have this sort of little picky point, although I guess it's, I should hesitate to call it a picky point because you can get, you can get burned alive for <laughs> saying the wrong thing. But, you know, it just seems, it seems so pointless and obscure. Um, you know, the, the entire Western church split or the entire church, Christian church split over a question that was something like, does the, Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and the Son, or does it proceed from the Father through the Son? Right. And so you have these, you know, these seemingly obscure points that just split history. Uh, you know, but anyway, I, you know, th so th these questions just make me think, what, you know, what makes a life meaningful? Is it, I don't know. Can I, um, I, I understand where you're coming from, Nevit. Um, I mean, par I, I'll just be personal for a moment if you all don't mind. Um, my religious background is my mom's side of the family was Methodist, uh, and my, but my dad's side of the family is Greek, Russian, Christian, Orthodox. And you really can't get farther away with those two. So it, 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 it without even thinking about it, you kind of start asking questions, right? Because the, the, the approach, the, the rituals or lack thereof and, and all that. But um, <clears throat> I, I um, this is the first time that the first sentence 
uh, I've read this multiple times, and this is the first time when I read the first sentence that I laughed when I came to the end of it. Um, you know, it's after raised the garden, profaned the chalices and the altars, the Huns entered the monastery library on horseback. That's an image. And trampled the incomprehensible books and burned them, perhaps fearful that the letters concealed blasphemies against their God, which was an iron scimitar. Now, I, I mean, I don't know why I, it, it just, I cracked up and every single time I thought about it, I laughed again. But then I thought to myself, the scimitar is a curved sword, right? It's usually, a, it's considered a weapon. It's, it's used in war. And then I thought about the cross in the Christian faith. And I remember reading an essay some time ago where the person made the observation, which I don't understand why I never thought of it before, that the Christian religion is the only major religion that actually uses as its symbol a, um, an instrument of torture. And I'm like, whoa, you know, maybe these Huns on horseback trampling through a library, I, we're not, the, Christians aren't that different. I mean, they have an iron scimitar and we have an instrument of torture. Um, and then, Nevit, uh, I just happened to see, um, I apologize, I'm blanking on the historian's full name, but it's Gates. Uh, he's an African-American historian. Uh, Louis Gates, I think, Louis Gates Jr. Anyway, he has a PBS series on the African-American experience. And the number of black men who were, who were not even, it's more, it's not even leveling the accusation. It was just asserted that they were guilty of somehow disrespecting white women. The number of black men in the South who were burned to death. And I'm thinking that's, they were certainly burned to death because of, 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 of a belief system. I mean, you know, we may not think of white supremacy as a belief system, but, but it is. And when you think of all of the trappings, all of the symbols, you know, stars and bars, however we want to do it, the, 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 um, the Aunt Jemima, you know, and the minstrel shows and the Uncle Tom, and uh, which is still, I think, uh, a shame because if you look at Uncle Tom in Uncle Tom's cabin, he's a Christ-like figure. It was the minstrel shows which distorted that literary character. But, and it's when, Nevit, you said, you, you mentioned burning at the stake, what's going on here? And I thought, my God, you know, just seeing, seeing this documentary reminded me the sheer number of black men burned to death because they had violated the norms and the beliefs of the dominant society. And I thought, we're not talking the Middle Ages. We're talking 20th century. And so the, it caused me to look at this story very differently and, and to broaden its application to secular ideologies, secular ways of you know, organizing society. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because I see I think in a way, this is pretty common for Borges, I think, is he kind of gives a sort of parody of, you know, scholarly erudition in a way. And I think he's kind of, he's doing the parody for, you know, a very uh, poignant reason. And here, I think what's going on here is, so he says on... Um, my edition, it's at the very end of 121 when he's talking about the the guy who says, you know, that uh, everything returns, you know, basically the eternal return guy, you, Euphorbus, that the John guy kind of condemned. As they're lighting him, he says, you know, on the pyre, this has happened and will happen again. You are not lighting a pyre, you are lighting a labyrinth of flames. If all the flames I have been were gathered together here, they would not fit on earth and the angels would be blinded. I have said this many times. And basically, this ends up 
becoming very true because then John himself, obviously he gets also burned at the stake. And then the narrator also ends up being lit in flames. And so I see here, it's kind of like what you're talking about with history, that there's this constant, you know, these cycles of, or it's almost like, you know, if you think of it in terms of like content form, it's like this form keeps repeating itself in these cycles of persecution based off all these distinctions, you know, where, so Bergson, he says in a, a later work about, you know, the two sources of morality that there's this kind of open morality and a closed morality. A closed morality is basically has to make distinctions and boundaries and includes some people. And it's kind of like the intellect that, you know, makes all these discrete, you know, distinctions between things, but it always has to exclude something from it. And I see that here. And it's in a way it's a kind of, it's similar to Funes in that, you know, he's showing that there's all these very subtle uh, from that perspective. Um, sort of, let's see. Oh, there, you're back. I'm back. Okay. What was the last thing you guys heard? Uh, you mentioned Funis. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of what I see there is basically the reason that these people are kind of stuck though in this cycle is because they are, are ruled by this notion of, of kind of infinitely trying to make distinctions and, you know, in order to say that some things are included and, you know, our social identity and some things are excluded that there's kind of, and that I think is kind of like this function of the intellect, but then if it's taken too far, like Funes did, then anything can be distinct from anything. And then the whole notion uh, of having a kind of, you know, consistent identity of some type, it ceases to have any kind of meaning. And I think that's what's going on here in that, you know, this on one level, these two theologians are very similar, but yet they're constantly making distinctions and You froze again. And whatnot. Uh, it's pretty... am I, am I, I guess I'm back. Um, yeah, my inner You said the two theologians were similar. And then I, I kind of lost you. Well, um, I'll comment on that. I'm not sure if this is where Chase was going. Um, but, okay, so Chase, you want to finish? Yeah, I guess uh, try again. So basically, I think he's showing that if you go too far into making all these distinctions, then you can basically kind of lose the sense of the continuity or, or this kind of, uh, you know, that everyone wants to make in, in the sense of, at least in terms of social and a kind of political reality where you have to either include some people into your social identity or exclude other people. In this case, 
everyone that's excluded gets burned at the stake. And I think he's kind of showing that if you make too, if you are like Funes and you can't see any kind of generality or, or, or identity in common with these people, then you're forever going to be burning people at the stake in a sense. You're constantly going to be excluding and including people and cutting things up and dissecting things to the point where the actual continuity of things ceases to make any sense. And I think what he wants to do is show that, you know, both of those tendencies have kind of pragmatic limits, I guess you could say. And that's sort of what he's trying to show here. Yeah. Maybe I'm just repeating what you said, um, which may help be helpful because then I'll, you can tell me whether I understand you. So this labyrinth of flames then is maybe a, um, in a sense, an artifact of the use of reason. And um, so reason has its value, but it also, when we stake too much on it, can or maybe not only can, but maybe just naturally tends to have this kind of, of effect because we make divisions and then we stake our lives in those divisions. And we have to make those divisions because that's the way we, we grasp the world, the way we understand the world and make it intelligible. But the downside is that then we, we accept those rational divisions as sacred in some way and and stake our lives on those, those as a result of them. Is that kind of the, the idea? Oh, I went away again. Is that, is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah, that's that's pretty much exactly it. And, you know, I realize there's almost kind of like a, a Kantian kind of ring to this story in that, you know, it's like um, at the very end, you know, this indiscernible God, not indiscernible, yeah, I think the God is basically like this apophatic, like unspeakable divinity that is outside of time that sees this identity between all these men. And there's that. And then it's kind of like within time, though. history the the thing that fails ultimately okay can you guys hear me now okay so basically there's this almost like kantian noumenal god that sees all these men in commonality that they're they're indistinguishable but then from within time where you need the intellect to make sense of these things to make distinctions and whatnot it it still at the same time fails to grasp ultimately that indiscernible divine identity in common that it's like the intellect is something reason is something that's necessary to kind of make sense of identity because it's what kind of includes and excludes people from your group identity but at the same time it also fails at that because it can't grasp this this indiscernible divine, you know, transcendent identity, I guess you could say. So I think that's something like what's going on there, but it has a definite uh, kind of social critique in there as well. I think I've uh, subjected you to my rant before on the uh, terrible way that, that Chinese people cut up chickens. And so, uh, you know, if you, uh, I have it. Okay. I don't think uh, so. So the rational way to cut up a chicken is to cut it through its joints, right? You know, you've got the leg and the wing and the wow. breast and that makes sense. But, um, often when you, when I've gone to Chinese restaurants, it's just like, it's just like they take a big clear and just go chunka, 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 chunka. And you get these weird, square chunks of meat that are kind of sometimes there's white and dark mixed and there's bones weird bones in there you can't tell what the hell is this piece of chicken um but you know that so maybe there's an illustration of you know my my notion of of, of 
my rational notion of cutting up a chicken is cutting along its joints, which is a, a Taoist idea, by the way. Uh, but then, um, you know, the, but then maybe their rational way is you cut it up into a grid because that's a nice grid. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, if I was king of the world, I wouldn't execute everyone who cuts up a chicken wrongly. But although my college roommate used to say that if he ever owned a restaurant, he would execute anyone who tore le uh, lettuce up into two big pieces, you know, that were not bite-sized. But, um, you know, those sorts of judgments are, you know, features of the way, you know, there's this, so there's this unsettling issue that comes up, it's, maybe it's always been in philosophy, but especially in the 19th century, of to what degree is does reason give us you know universal truths and to what degree is reason a tool or an instrument of irrational or non-rational motives and so you know to say well cutting up a chicken this way is more rational than cutting up a chicken that way maybe that's because i have some um non non-rational, I don't mean non-rational in the, way, in the sense of irrational as in crazy, but just some motive that makes me think it's better to cut up a chicken this way. And maybe those cooks have some non-rational motive that makes them want to think it's better to cut it up this way. And then we both use reason uh, as an instrument to, to doing that. But that, um, you know, if rationality or the theologians, the things they decide to make, the, stake their lives on, stake their lives on. Um, I mean, the, the reason it's unsettling is because, you know, I, it, if you don't, if you think reason is merely an instrument of, of non-rational motives, then it becomes difficult to find any ground for making not only making broad judgments, but for it. The, the problem is you end up, you could end up with an extreme relativity, which some people says, say is great. But then on the other hand, if you're an extreme relativist and you're in, you know, it's 1944 and Hitler's over there uh, rounding up millions of people and killing them. And you're a relativist, you don't even have any, any rational basis for saying what they're doing is wrong. So, you know, it's a difficult topic. Yeah. You know, burning people at the stake because they have theological differences seems kind of crazy. On the other hand, um, you know, exterminating six million people also, you know, that seems like something we ought to stop. You know, maybe we shouldn't stop people from making wild theological claims, but it does seem like maybe we should stop people from executing one another. So, I don't know, you know, if you, if you, I don't know if that's one of the points here, but if one of the points is, you know, like Chase is saying that, re, you know, reason, if you use it in a certain way, can have these sort of pernicious consequences. On the other hand, if you deny reason any ability to provide universal, a universal ground of at least communication, then can you make any judgments at all? Any broad judgments? Well, no, you, go ahead. What, what you brought up, I, I think, is really core because, you know, again, if, if we broaden this, it, it's, it isn't this story about our reactions to truth or truth claims? And then what about competing ideologies? How do we pick among them? And, um, and then what happens if, if a, 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 a truth or truth small t, capital T, <clears throat> then become accepted by not only one person, but millions of people. Is there something about human beings that it's very dangerous for large groups of people? And this is a phrase where I read in one of the reviews to cast aside multiple versions of the truth. I mean, if, if we're limited, if, if we're finite, the, one would say then that, that we don't have, we will never be have a complete understanding. 
of our world uh, and our place in it. So shouldn't there be a certain humility in, in, in a range of understandings, including ideology? Um, oh, Chase, did you want to? No, go ahead. I'm just, I, it's not like, yeah, okay. I'll, I just wanted to say, um, I just think something that I, that I, again, I don't, I don't know if, I don't think this is Borges, like, primary idea while writing this, but I thought it was interesting, both the, this discussion of ideology is coming up and this notion of relativism in the, in the context of this story, because I thought, the, to me, I thought this was like a story of like dramatic irony where these two competing theologians have pretty much the exact same point. And one of them is constantly, I, this is how I think of him. Uh, you know, it's just, I, it's so close. Cool. They agree on almost everything, but there's, there's just this desire. Even, almost because I agree with them, it's like, I, I have to be the first one to say the thing I know that that guy over there is about to say. But so, and then it takes this wild, destructive, insane turn where the main character decides, oh, well, now that we have, now that he and I, this, you know, like imagine Travis and I, we, we have <laughs> formulated our attack against these histrions, these her this, uh, his heresiarch and his simulacra, as they're called, apparently, we have, we have mounted the assault and we have, you know, the wheel fell to the cross in a way. And now that that's done, now that we have nobody to go hate, 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 like in 1984 when he's there, they're doing the two minute hate, there's, there's nobody left to do a two minute hate app. So it's like Aurelian was like, oh, well, you know, now that, uh, now that those guys are gone uh, and then time has passed, it seems like the, the ideas have kind of moved. It's like the, it's like the team, it's like the Democrat and Republican party, like kind of switching sides almost. It's, it's like, now he, he took an opportunity. He was an opportunist, and he said, "Okay, now, now that the that times are changing, Aurelian, the same the same things he was saying just a couple years ago in in a, in a attack of these these histrions, I can say because because of the nature of the institution that we're both, you know, towing under, I can say that the things he is saying are now heretical." And and now he and if I'm the first one, to, and I bet this guy's thinking it too. I bet John is thinking about pulling the trigger on me. I got to get to him first. I, I think that something that I noticed because of that was kind of the um, the notion of these two individuals acting within the framework of a universal ideology of the institutionalized Christianity as this as this force. Where I think that ideology. And this is what, what Ed was saying, how do we pick between this ideology or that ideology? I think that the primary problem that I have with, and I'm not saying that I have some solution or something better because I'm not a supercomputer, but I think that ideology as a concept, as a notion, in it, I mean, in, in, in its empirical realization as a notion, it has this fundamental characteristic of being an open container in a way. You know what I mean? It's this thing that is, you know, ideology is an open container in the sense that it is available to all possible interpretation. There are, there are African American individuals who, who and, 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 and even African nationalist individuals who sympathize very heavily with the project of the National Socialists in Germany of 1939. And, and there are, I've, I've seen like, it's plenty of, plenty of weird contradictory ideas like that where, where any human being no matter their the the empirical reality of their situation can fall into the ideology as an empty container and that ideology can point itself at anything as this oh it's the jews that are doing it oh it's unwed uh, in britain there was this big campaign in, in the 90s against unwed mothers uh single mothers were the reason that britain was collapsing uh and like, you know, if it wasn't the Jews, it was, it was the gypsies. And if it was, excuse me for saying, you know, but, or the, uh, or the landless cosmopolitans in general, any one of them, it's just, oh, it's, it's something to point at, you know? And I think that the emptiness, the kind of universalizability of the ideological force of we need somebody to burn uh, can be instantly inverted against the same exact people who were defending it the day before if only because they're not in style anymore. And that's the fickle sort of caprice of, of ideology as it 
rains across the world attempting to suck up as many hands and hearts as it can, you know what I mean? I think that's, that's just something I noticed in the story, not that it's like that was Borges' point or something. Yeah, that's definitely what I got from it in the sense that I think kind of what he's getting at here is that even orthodoxy, you know, it seems like this, you know, eternal thing that's, uh, you know, transcendent and whatnot, that it kind of, it needs some kind of other, some outsider, some scapegoat in order to really define itself. It defines itself in respect to essentially these heretics. And when the heretics change, so does the orthodoxy, the point where you have this inversion where the, what was used as, you know, like perfect orthodoxy, like, well, I mean, basically it's kind of funny also because they're, they're obviously cherry picking these lines from the Bible and these ancient texts in order to, you know, condemn this view of, you know, of cyclical history that everything repeats innumerably and then someone comes along and gives the exact opposite uh, heresy and then suddenly they have to cherry pick new lines in order to justify the opposite line so there's this kind of yeah it's an open container it's like it's something that's flexible that's more kind of like a power structure that has to constantly define itself by having some kind of a scapegoat or an other to, to show this is what we are not in order to show what we are. That this is a fluid, ongoing social thing. And because of that, there's always going to be, you know, this kind of perverse inversions of itself, which go along with the, the funny way that a lot of the heretics are also have like this kind of symbol of inversion going on. A lot of times they're, so especially the, the histriones or whatever, they're thinking very much in terms of like inversions of the, the hermetic principle. Well, some of them are, you know, that as above, so below, or what you do here is echoed in heaven or in this double. And they kind of invert that to say, no, in fact, you know, what we do here is the opposite. It, that means that it can't be repeated. So, you know, do as many horrible things as you can here. And then in this inverted state that, you know, is kind of co-reciprocally defined by its inversion is echoed somewhere else. I think you can almost see that, that the histriona's idea there of this kind of like, like invert the some kind of uh, closed identity of itself. So does that make any sense? Uh, um, something I, I'm having trouble with, I, I, um, Travis or um, Hunter and and Chase is the um the notion of um this what did you call it not emptiness but um so i, I think open of, container I, yeah open container container because i think of uh an ideology as being really rigid that that's an a one characteristic of an ide ideology is really dogmatic and it it's like you in order to be part of this group you've got to believe these rigid ideas um and so i think of it being you know not open in that sense being very rigid and, and dogmatic and so i know Tra uh, or a uh, hunter you i keep saying it travis because on my screen travis's name is right under your face but anyway um you know both you and chase have been talking about being open in the sense that it can be directed toward anyone but i'm, I'm having trouble with that since i think of it as being a, a rigid set of doctrines I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just asking uh, you to help me understand. I've got a, I think I've got a case in point here. <laughs> I think, um, okay. So I think that what you're describing is definitely the, the explicit, and this is all in Sublime Object, the videology, the 1989 book. Um, 
there is with it. I think of, I, like, I like to I can when I conceive of things like ideas. I think of them in some sort of physical way for some reason because it helps me imagine things. Like I'm, I'm a little diorama. So I imagine ideology is like a dome with a smaller dome inside of it. I, I, I imagine that the outer dome is the explicit message, the explicit direct dogma, right? But as far as ideology through history is concerned, there is always within that dogma, within this explicit message, there is an implicit set of rules that you have to know in order to be a member of that ideology, and yet you can never make explicit. As a, and I'll give you an example. The Roman Catholic Church, not as a, I'm not, this is not against Christianity as a whole, but against the Catholic Church as an institution. There is an ideological framework there, wherein the explicit message is penance, is, is uh, repentance, uh, suffering, asceticism, you know, being a, a nun, go to a convent, uh, you know, uh, let go be this this godly individual right who, who lives in a godly way and abides by god's commandments but at the same time and this is proven in or not proven but this is supported by a scene in the sound of music when the nun character or the main character girl she goes to mother superior after going to the von trapp family and she says oh mother superior i, I could hardly breathe I, I i loved him so i i i knew that i was there on god's errand and and mother superior's response is not yeah, you're right. You're getting kind of horny on the job. You should probably tone that down. That's kind of un, that's weird. Her response is, go, go get him. Go do it, you know? And she literally sings a song, climb every mountain, swim every stream, ex exercise your deepest hedonistic desires. See to it that you see every inch of the world, every dirty, depraved, obscene, disgusting element that is possibly there. D dig deep until you drink from it like the water of life. And, and then you can come back to the convent and sign the thing and then you're good. <laughs> you do the, you do, do the rosary and then, ah, okay. And then, so, so there's a, the explicit message is be godly, be serious, be a Catholic, you know? But then the implicit message is you signed the, you, the contract with the divine big other. You now have permanent insurance against damnation. Do whatever you want. And then come back every week for, um, for what confession. That was also a point in the movie Don John, which was terrible, but it starred uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and uh, some other woman. And, and the, the, he's constantly going out and having hedonistic sex and being this young Italian New Yorker, hey, you know. And then he goes to church and, and is like pumping iron for this party that he's going to. He's like doing the rosary while he's doing the, yeah, you know, our father who art in heaven, you know, whatever. So that's, that's what I think. That's, that's what I think. No, it's just, it's just, I, <laughs> you really threw the mother superior under the bus. I don't think she was saying, you know, get your sex on, you know, just, just screw everybody you can find in the Alpine regions of Austria. It was, he is your true love. And if you remember Catholicism, it's be fruitful and multiply. Yes, there are certain people that are supposed to be chaste and to be separate. But remember, what's the really after Maria's running around that stupid hill singing about the sound of music, all the other, all the other nuns are singing how she doesn't fit in. How do you solve a problem like Maria? And it seems to me what the Mother Superior is saying is you can still be a good Catholic because you can be a mother to these motherless children and you can reconcile your, 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 your human love for this man and still serve a very Catholic function of raising these children to be good Catholics. So I, 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 I mean, I, 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 I do think that, I, I mean, I'm glad you brought it up because it was a, I never thought of the <laughs> mountain being <laughs> a manifesto for licenses -ness. Um, but but I, in fairness I, I think it is really more that remember if you if if you were a young man and you were thinking and you entered the priesthood seriously because I don't think anybody would do that on a lark I hope not um, and then you felt these normal human feelings 
Um, I would hope that the the Abbot, whatever the the title of it would be, would would really talk with you and say, "Hey, there are other ways of being faithful. There are other ways of being a Christian <coughs> than being a priest." And you really need to work through what all that means, but don't think you're rejecting God or rejecting the church. You can still fulfill it in other ways. Hmm. ways I've got to okay. admit that I like uh, Hunter's interpretation or basically uh, Zizek's. Was, I know he talks about that in the, the Perfect's Guide to Ideology, where he talks about the sound of music and and they live where i think that's really interesting uh so he his analysis of they live is pretty interesting i don't know if you guys have seen that movie the awesome 80s movie where the guy puts on sunglasses and can see that really all these you know capitalist yuppies are really aliens that uh have like put consumer society in place so that we'll be fooled by it in a sense and Zizek says that basically uh, the world that you see without the glasses um, in the movie, you know, based on our kind of like ordinary world, that's basically the, that's ideology on one level, but that's kind of like the explicit form that doesn't really, uh, maybe I'm using the wrong terminology, but that's kind of, what's covering up the real actual message, the kind of internal message of ideology where when he actually puts on the sunglasses and sees in stark black and white messages that are just like consume, uh, reproduce, marry and reproduce, things like that. Uh, like the dollar bills is like, this is your God, things like that. That that's kind of the underlying message, which so, I think you can see it definitely in that sense, but going back to kind of like the fluidity of it, I think um, the notion of interpretation is very uh, important here in the sense that, you know, you can have any kind of set ideology, say they have like a, a sacred text of it's, you know, just one sentence. Well, you can have basically infinite interpretations of that one sentence and you can have essentially infinite sex within that religion that will kill each other over competing interpretations of that one sentence. So no matter what, you're going to have a, a kind of social fluidity that's centered around interpretations, even around a kind of, you know, set, static uh, canon of orthodox text. So I think that's kind of where you can get the these... Uh, these notions of both, you know, the fixity of ideology on one level, and that it usually is serving some kind of a power, though it's it, in its actual fluid state, it's serving some kind of power structure, and that's where it's going to be fluid. That's where you're going to get, you know, the colorful world of advertising and things like that, versus, you know, the stark black and white that usually has a message that is basically centered on control in some sense. So, I mean, you can also think of uh, Foucault and whatnot that, you know, knowledge always has some kind of structure of power to go along with it, where I don't know if I completely agree with that in totality or that, you know, this Boris story is exactly saying that, but I think it's kind of saying like the distinctions we make, you know, within ideas usually do have a kind of almost personal power kind of structure to them, where you know, these people, they have these very personal kind of, uh, you know, this personal rivalry going on. And yet it becomes the way that they actually, he engages this guy in terms of uh, exercising some kind of power and whatnot over him is through his thing of basically making these the theological distinctions that exclude this guy, that only gets him burned at the stake. But ultimately, it's driven by these very personal, you know, even uh, just very uh, 
banal things that this the guy like they compete over rewards and things like that and and these honors and that's basically why the guy doesn't like him so i think all those things are kind of going on and he's kind of he is kind of saying that there's this kind of uh social of it's like a this banal social activity that we make kind of pollutes these what we think of as like these pure ideas and whatnot. You know, we think that we're it's purely intellectual, this like theological act of, you know, discerning orthodoxy and, and what is heresy and whatnot. But here I think he's shown even internally within those those theologians, there's still something else going on that's motivating those theological distinctions that are ultimately more just ways of trying to kind of arbitrarily divide these people themselves and ultimately to kind of self-destruction. So, so let me a ask a, qu a question. Um, so are you guys saying then that, so is the openness this, that a, an ideology will have a dogmatic set of, of uh, beliefs or claims or something that everyone has to subscribe to publicly, but that because an ideology is always a manis manifestation of uh, either, let's say, some non-rational or maybe pre-conscious motives, or because it's motivated by some power that the members will actually interpret those, those rigid criteria in, in whatever terms they need to, to maintain the, those, to support those motives or those, or those power drives. Is that what you're saying? Uh, if, I think, um, I think yes. And I have an example, if I, I if I may, about the kind of, um, the implicit versus the explicit. So, and this is a this is a story directly ripped from a lecture by Zizek, and it's and it's, he was in Ljubljana in Slovenia. It was or, not Slovenia yet; it was Yugoslavia. There was a communist leader, a commissar, who came to talk to the to the local Marxist youth, you know, at a, this big rally, you know, town hall thing. He said, "This is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is." And now, to all my youths out there, I want you to make sure all of you. Are, uh, are, are good, good Marxist Leninists, good hardcore socialists, you know, you believe in the value form or whatever, and, and make sure you read both volumes of Marx's Capital, and, and you know, you dot your I's and cross your T's and thank you all and have a good night. And he says, well, goodbye. And then Zizek is, is, is a young, uh, already kind of trying, uh, trying to engage in his symbolic identity as something of a dissident, and he's apparently approaching this individual or somebody close to him and says, hey, hey, excuse me, like afterwards, he's like, you know, hey, um, I just, there's like, I think it's either a slip of the tongue or something, but there were three volumes of Capital. <laughs> there are three volumes of Capital. I don't know why that guy said, and the guy's like, shut, 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 shut up, shut up. You think we don't know that? Of course we know that. We know that there are three volumes of Capital. We don't want that whole crowd to think that we care about all three volumes of capital, just just say two. Make it think. Make them think that you don't care. That you're blasé. Uh, you know, whatever. Read two. Read three. Read whatever. I can't remember how many there are because I don't even care. Otherwise, they're going to think we're socialists or something, and then they're not going to listen to us. <laughs> There's no chance that they're going to care what we have to say if they think we're these staunch red guards who are trying to uphold the Marxist-Leninist idea. We're we're going to lose them. So you get just. Just, just say two. Just, or make make yourself seem a little dumb. You know, so there's this, there's this implication there. The the idea is that the ideological apparatus does not force the individuals within its constraints to believe. Rather, it forces them to not believe. You have to be critical. You have to be skeptical. You have to feel removed. You have to feel that's how it will hold you best. <laughs> you know, there's there's an implicit sort of um, direction with the, the actions of the ideological apparatus that maintain power first, way beyond a set of ideals or beliefs or something like that. It's just the, 
you know, the meat of the matter is, is, the, is the, the power at hand. And, that, and it's also illustrated in another Zizekian thing. The implication is, is illustrated in the notion of having two fathers. This is the last thing I'm saying because we're getting late and it's closing remarks, but you have two, two types of dads. One is dad type A who says, hey, you're going to your grandmother's and you're going to like it because fuck you. You're, you're, you're a little idiot and you don't know what's good for you and you're going to go and you're going to like it. And you say, okay, and you can resent him and say, oh, I hate you, you bastard, whatever. Uh, but, but then you have dad type two who says, you don't have to go to your grandmother's, but you do know how much she loves you. And you know how important it is for, to her that you go. Now, I'm not going to force you. You don't have to go. But I just want to let you know that your grandmother will be very disappointed if you don't. Okay? I love you. And then the child who's not an idiot is thinking, because they're not, children are, are, you know, relatively intelligent, you know, as Marley Ponty would say so, but uh, it's, it's okay. Now, not only do I have to go, right, but I have to do it of my own free will. I have to want to go. I have to like it. I have to love my grandmother. And if I don't go, not only am I resisting a power struggle, right, am I just kind of taking a stance in the world of meaning, I'm now an asshole, because apparently I don't love my grandmother because I'm not going. You see, it's, it's this, it's a much more insidious implication in the second. It's, it's the dictatorship through the democracy. It's the hidden layer of, of, of domination behind the, the layer of niceties that, that kind of define, or the, the, the inverse, where, where you have uh, power structures that are so dedicated to the idea of order and authority that it totally loses the plot. Like in China, we had ser a series of factories in, eastern, in the eastern seaboard of China, in the nor northeastern section of China, I don't remember the name of the province, but there was this, I read this article, there was like, oh yeah, these, these factories needed to report a certain amount of productivity. Right, but the material due to COVID was not flowing into the factory for processing. It was plastics. They needed plastics, and they weren't getting enough plastics to process the same amount of material they were doing every day. So they figured out how do they measure the productivity of the factory? Oh, it's how much power is being used on the electricity grid. So fuck it. Let's just so they just run the machines with nothing in them, and power is getting surged out of these machines and spent, and the grid is in it. Oh, cool, you know, there we go. It's, it's this total, total, um, I just, I, I wanna say, I, w I wanna say something like, like the fragility, the, 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 the ease with which we can kind of cast away this, the explicit of ideology. The explicit notions of ideology are, are the most easily cast aside for the, for the implicit real demands, you know, uh, of the ideological apparatus. You see what I'm saying? In, yeah. in some sense? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm not making sense. I don't know. I'm probably delivering think, this. But. I think another example could be something like, um, you know, the religious right, so-called. Um, I don't know if I want to open this can of worms, but I will. I'm already doing it, basically. So, um, before, think of, like, Bush era and, like, with the whole kind of uh, born again Christian thing, very, you know, strict, you know, Christianity, you know, and now the same people that are really into that, and now like Donald Trump, who is not a very uh, born again Christian, you know, it, it at least <laughs> doesn't seem like to me that he's like almost like religious at all, it, it seems like, but still, a lot of those, uh, you know, fundamentalist Christians, you know, since basically since uh, about the 80s when when fundamentalist Christianity got, really got into politics, then it basically, whoever is the one person that kind of represents that power structure um, becomes fluid as in all accept whatever that is, you know, to the point where now they can see, you know, Trump almost as a sort of savior figure when before, I think if he was put in opposition to someone, you know, like George Bush, who, you know, obviously was ridiculous, but at least kind of more played the part of like, I could believe he was like some kind of a born again, you know, Christian kind of like in comparison with Bush, Trump would have been seen as like this horrible, you know, 
licentious like being who, who would be you know completely rejected from fundamentalist Christian uh, politics, but by comparison, just because the power structure happened to be put in that camp, then they you know throw and project all the these aspects of their social identity onto him. So I think that's one way you could see that it's kind of it has this fluidity. But at the same time, the fluidity is a kind of continuation of something that is that is kind of stacked. But it, I think it, ultimately they are all kind of ultimately changing, um, and that's kind of uh, I think that's really the point that is going on, especially with this story. And that you know you can have almost these complete inversions where one thing is orthodox, and then you know five years later they're burning at the stake for. For saying the exact same thing because ultimately you know what the guy did wrong the, the john guy is he he was out of touch at the time he didn't realize that the orthodoxy had changed and that's why he kept arguing for something that was a, a null point you know those people had already the previous people had already been burned at the stake now they're going after something else you know it's kind of like um Bergson says the intellect is really geared towards like this pragmatic action in a way it cuts things up and divides things so that it can act on them and in a way this john guy was like he was still using those divisions that were cut up for action previously that's he was out of touch at the time he was, you know time out of joint and that's ultimately why he can deal with it he couldn't deal with the the fluidity of it because he only saw it in a, in a very static way and yeah, it definitely, there's a lot to, to go on with, uh, in terms of about, you know, ideology and stuff here in the story, but yeah. Um, if, if I can, I, there's, well, there's probably more than three explanations for how the religious right, who I will grant most of them really are true believers, could embrace what to me is the least Christian president we've ever had and I'm acknowledging that Thomas Jefferson was probably an atheist. Um, so, uh, and um, one, one very political reason, Chase, is you look at uh, the candidate Trump's early primary wins, he faced the divided opposition. Go back to 1992 when Patrick Buchanan uh, challenged incumbent President George Bush, and they are getting strikingly the same percentage of the vote. The difference was Buchanan was facing <coughs> an incumbent president where Trump was facing, God, what, 15 opponents? A second one would, could potentially, I think Nietzsche talks about this, but so does Harold Laswell in personal politics and personal, inter no. Gosh, why am I forgetting? I've read this book five, 500 times. Um, World Politics and Personal Insecurity. And then also Eric Fromm's Escape from Freedom, the idea of the politics of resentment. And people felt aggrieved. Trump was expressing their resentment and was articulating, and from an old 1976 movie, articulating the popular rage, remember Network. Um, a third explanation if you want to get the current Atlantic Monthly, July, August 2020, uh, the cover story is on the nature of complicity, Trump's enablers and the judgment of history by Ann Applebaum. And she actually talks about collaborators. And she comes up with <coughs> about, about five reasons that different groups of people are, are willing to explain away all the all the tr troublesome, problematic aspects of Trump's presidency. Uh, so she's not talking about the people who voted for him in 2016. She's talking about after three and a half years, the people who are still sticking with him because now he's got a presidential record. In spite of that record, they're coming up with excuses. And uh, maybe it's because of this short story, we've been focusing on the problems of, of ideology but Chase, you made a point of um, earlier, I think it was you, maybe it was Hunter, about the, um, you said the personal 
um, the per that that this is really ideological disputes are driven by personal needs or wants. <clears throat> I think you fra use the phrase banal social activity, and that's really what Applebaum is getting at. That if if you you have to look at personal motivation, why are these people who supposedly are principled? Why do they seem to be not principled anymore and they're okay with it and uh, uh exhibit a is senator lindsey graham from south carolina who somebody sarcastically described him as uh, when he talks about meeting with trump it, it's like uh it's like the head of the debate team gushing over the high school quarterback uh bringing him into the inner circle and um anyway th those are just the thoughts i had in response to to years and hunter's uh comments so my, my uh, sort of summary of, I think, what you guys are saying is that ideologies as a rule are tools of either, po uh, either power or personal motives, which are maybe, the, uh, maybe, maybe that's just personal power as opposed to sort of a corporate power, so that um, they're flexible in the sense that their proponents will interpret them in whatever way they need to in order to deploy their power. Is that the kind of? Yeah, and I think that they're incredibly powerful when it's easy to mistake like a personal motivation for that ideology. Yeah, and I mean, it does seem to be a recurring thing. I mean, it, uh, you know, if I had read some of the books you guys had read, maybe I, I would already have realized this, but you see it a lot, you know, one that pops into mind is um, the conservative ideal of local power and of always trying to push power down, uh, you know, like away from, you want to push as much power from the federal government down into the states, in cities and cities and communities. And yet, when you have local communities in Texas doing things that the Republican governor doesn't like, the Republican governor then exerts state power and says, no cities, you can't do that. Right. So, I mean, it just seems to be there, you know, I can see where if that's, it's open in the sense, I guess, then that you can always redeploy or kind of pivot the interpretation so that it always, um, always manages to, so, to sustain that power. Yeah, pretty much. That's the way I see it. And, you know, one thing uh, that reminds me of is, I can't remember if it was, I think it was either they're looking through the, the, these like files. I can't remember if it's like, it was Nazi Germany or it was, it was uh, East Germany. But I remember these historians went through what, um, basically these people that had turned in other people and they showed basically that most of the time these were completely trivial disputes that were motivating someone snitching on another person usually kind of probably concocting some kind of reason of you know they're not following the orthodoxy um but ultimately if you got to it it was usually people like uh jealousy uh envy people things like that were, were driving this really it was you know ex-girlfriends and ex-boyfriends uh you know neighbors and things like that that for whatever reason had some kind of personal conflict against people and they were using the power structure to in a sense condemn their neighbors and friends and people to you know whatever fate so i think it's but uh, I don't, I wouldn't say all of it is necessarily goes in that dimension, but I think there's a certain extent that does. And as long as I, it goes on the level, the debate is only on the level of, you know, pure explicit ideology that it kind of, you can no longer kind of see the, the dimension underneath that, which is these kind of very personal, uh, almost animalistic, kind of motivations that really actually propel, I think, uh, like mammalian hierarchies is that's still kind of what we're involved in. And I think, you know, humans want to 
think they're they're special and that they can put everything into the intellect and it's all just a matter of you know this uh ethereal thought that we're thinking of like like we're you know plato and aristotle like debating these things but really it's uh a lot of these things are embodied in these kind of mammalian hierarchy politics and yeah that's i think that is sort of what borges is getting at amongst other things i wish we had time to kind of like go into like those two different uh heretical theologies but obviously we're oh it's 420 yeah <laughs> did anybody notice something uh, to me that was odd um if you look at the, it's this story is about two theologians, right? But it seems to, it's not, it, what she, my sense though is it's really one theologian that's really developed really well. His personality, and the other one, you only know him almost through the other theologian reading him. And I just thought that that was interesting. Why did Borges do it that way? Um, because other times he will have two characters that you do get a sense of two or more and this one it's all or is it uh, aurelian we we get a better sense of and uh, john we just kind of have a sense through aurelian so yeah but then at the end you know the very last paragraph you know god says well you're really the same guy <laughs> so i mean I, that makes me i mean we're we're out of time but it makes me wonder about the relation of the sorts of things that chase and and Hunter been talking about an identity, um, that there's prob probably something interesting going on there, but we're kind of out of time. <laughs> so we good? I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, thank you. Uh, you guys uh, taught me some stuff, which is always good. Yay, learning. <laughs> we'll see you next. Right, see you later. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you all.